Welcome back to the Papa Meat Channel. How you doing? How you doing? Come on in and sit on down. Today we are talking about A24's newest film, But Was Afraid. I'm visiting my mother tomorrow. Do you ever wish that she was dead? What? Bo's Afraid is made by Ari Aster. He is probably the golden child of A24 with such hits as Hereditary and Midsummer. <laughs> Two movies that I found incredibly influential when they came out and still love them very much to this day. Hereditary really changed my perspective of what horror films could be. Before that, I didn't have as much love and respect as I do for horror because up until that point, it was just like jump scares and it was just people dying because that was the trend with Saul and Final Destination and all that kind of stuff. It was just, who couldn't have the craziest kills? Or how can we put a ghost in a house and scare you? Remember that? We're with, you know, Hereditary had the idea of family trauma, not having jump scares, having moments in the film that are very quiet and building tension. And that got my dick very, very, very hard. Because I thought to myself, my God, that's something I want to explore with my art. And I did. That's why I was excited to dive into this because I love Ari Aster, I love all of his work. You know, Hereditary, like I just said, Midsummer is great, but also his student film. He made a student film called The Strange Thing About the Johnsons, which I'm going to just play this clip here. I'm gonna show that out of context. You can just watch and see what that film's about. Speaking of the strange thing about the Johnsons is that Bo is Afraid was also a short film as well that has now evolved into a three hour long odyssey of a surrealist nightmare comedy that I think is going to polarize people in many, many ways. The film starts off very traditional and then it goes into a Charlie Kaufman-esque nightmare of surrealist introspection that makes you think about all of the horrible things that happen in your life and it brings it to the front and Bo is the perfect catalyst for the reflection of your own terrors and your own insecurities, which is really fun. Before we get into any spoilers, let me, let's just talk about what the movie's about really quick. Just a general understanding, which Bo is Afraid is a story about a man who is experiencing guilt, anxiety, and depression, all stemming from his traumatic experiences he had growing up with his emotionally manipulative mother. Put a picture of my mom right here. You fucking bitch. And the entire movie is basically a huge odyssey, a journey trying to get to his mom's house and meet with her. And it's just all of the crazy shit that happens along the way. To give a brief rating, if you want to see this on your own and you want to just see what I thought of it, it's two ratings. I gave it a nine out of 10, and I also gave it a two out of 10. It's going to be a movie that you either really vibe with it or you just were bored. I don't know. I left the theater and I was at a high, at a nine. But that's also because, you know, maybe I'm just like, you know, Daddy Ari Aster, love me, because I love you. But then part of me was also just like, what the hell is this thing? It's just crazy. I mean, if you have three hours to kill, hey, go see it. And if you're the kind of person, too, where it's like, I mean, what am I going to do, sit there for three hours? You're not going to like this movie. If that is a hurdle for you to be like, I mean, what am I going to do with three hours? All right, I mean, I got the stock market to look after. All right, I'm playing the numbers game here. Then don't watch this film. This film is not something that you are going to enjoy. I promise you that. By that conclusion too, I don't really know who this movie's for. It feels like this movie is for Ari Aster. It doesn't feel like it's really for anybody else. The attention to detail and the storytelling and like the imagery and the metaphors and all these like this crazy epic adventure. I think you can see yourself in this story, but I, I it's not like I'm like, oh, dude. This movie would be right up your alley. This movie does a lot of great things that makes you think it, it will sit with you. And I think you'll be thinking about a lot of the moments that happen in this movie, which I think is an effective movie. But let's get into it. Spoilers uh, are ahead. So if you don't want no spoilers, don't be watching no more. Fuck you, mom. My mom was actually in a very funny movie where she was on a bus. So but play, roll that clip real quick of my mom. Jesse's delicious. He's going to take me today to get a new toilet seat because mine got broken. It was sliding. Wow, look at her go. So to get just a idea of structure of this film while we talk about it, the movie is basically broken up into four parts, four chapters, if you will. The first chapter is Bo being in his comfort zone in his apartment and his journey is about to begin and he's in the big city and it's basically hell on earth. It is chaos. It is an over-exaggeration of all of the plights and troubles 
of the world manifested into an absurdly funny and crazy roller coaster of people that he has to survive every day. The second chapter is Bo basically getting a new life with a family that strikes him with a car, and it's almost like a faux new beginning to like a parental relationship, and it's also the family's coping mechanism with losing a child. Chapter three is a theatrical representation of what would happen if Bo didn't let the traumas of his mother, if his mother didn't ruin his life, what would have happened? What would have happened if Bo would have lived a normal life, basically, is how I read it. And then chapter four is the moment of reckoning and also the judgment of himself. Notice how the last, the last two, chapters three and four, were a bit kind of weird and out there because the movie gets very weird and out there at a very sharp turn in the movie. So buckle in. I think that the first two chapters read like a, a general audience could go in and find it really funny, disturbing, and well put together and understand what is happening on in front of them. And as soon as we get to act three, you could just tell people are like, what? And I guess just to paraphrase, if you like Charlie Kaufman movies, you like this movie. You ever see Thinking of Ending Things? Did you like that? Huh? What? Did you say something? Maybe. Did you see uh, Sindeki, Sind Sindeki New York? However the fuck you say that mess? Pick a better title, Charlie Kaufman. You know, adaptation, being John Malkovich. Weird, ethereal movies very surrealist in nature. It's a Charlie Kaufman movie. And it's, it feels just like Charlie Kaufman because it feels like a depressive fucking nightmare. And very much like how Charlie Kaufman is very unapologetic with his writing. He writes exactly what he wants to make. He writes things from his morbid, depressed heart. And if you don't get it, it's just like, okay, fuck off kind of vibe. And Ari Aster is making a movie that he wanted to make that has meanings to maybe just himself that if you don't understand or if you can't keep up, I don't know what to tell you. He made the movie he wants to make. And from an artistic standpoint, I really, I, I really, uh, I respect that. That doesn't mean you have to like it, but from a creative perspective, I'm just like, fuck yeah, man. Hell yeah. You do you. Make nonsense. <laughs> I'm depressed. I'm going to make a movie. That's going to be me in a couple of months, dude. Hey, 25 cents, Hunter. Oh God, I'm gonna make a depressed movie. A24, give me some money. I got a story I wanna tell. It's about an overweight son of a bitch who makes parodies online and he wants to kill himself. But going into it, let's get into chapter one. He lives in what I would assume be New York in like a very like underpoverished kind of area. People are just fucking ransacking the spots. People, there's just naked people in the streets. It's just a crime ridden area, but it feels like the entire city is this way. It kind of feels like the entire world he lives in is just chaotically evil and like out to get him. And this is where immediately when I first saw this, I kind of started to question like, oh, is this how he is perceiving the world? Or is this actually how the world is in this like, like weird cartoonish landscape. So immediately we're kind of like put in this realm of like, is the perception reality or is it through Bo's mind? Who knows? The one thing that I really loved about this chapter one sequence is for a movie that is supposed to be about, I mean, anxiety, depression, just this chaotic evil. The movie is so funny. I was un like so surprised by how much I laughed at this movie. There's this great shot that was so funny. You see Bo from the distance just dead sprinting down the road. And as soon as he starts to get to his apartment complex, this like completely tattooed man chases him into this building. It's done in a way where it looks like this is an everyday occurrence. Another Another great standout moment from this uh, chapter is Bo is given like a new kind of pill and you have to take it with water and every source of water in his apartment is shut off. So he has to run across this chaotic street to the, it's like the bodega next door and he is trying to buy a water that's like a dollar seventy and he has the dollar and he's trying to dig out change. But as he's doing it, the door that he left open, every single absurdist evil character is like pouring into his apartment and it's just really funny. There's a, a lot of great comedic setups. And the whole first chapter sets us up beautifully with showing Bo as like a hypochondriac, the absurdist nature of what this movie is going to be along with like the comedy that's to be expected. And all of it was just, I mean, it's fucking great. Joaquin also is like, I mean, like obviously he's a great actor, but he embodies this like very meek, funny guy that is so kind of relatable in a way. I just released a cartoon called Melvin, which it has similar themes of like the way that I wanted to make a character that embodies all of the poor ways that I handle my emotions or the way that you're a pushover. I do feel like Ari Aster is doing something similar where I feel like it's just the insecure, maybe hypochondriac version of himself 
itself that is uh, completely manifested into the character. And it's just really fucking cool to see. I really liked it. There's a lot of parts of the movie that are like, what the fuck does this mean? And one of these things for me, which I it, I think I need to do like multiple rewatches of this film, but his balls are so big. And later in the film, you find out it's because his mother lied to him and said that his dad had sex with her and it killed him. And he has the same kind of disease. So I think it's supposed to be like, oh, he's never had sex. And that's why his balls are so like swollen, but it's, they're, they're massive. I mean, they're, they are so big that it's, it, you first see them, you're like, what the fuck? Before we exit chapter one as well, we have to acknowledge that Bo is supposed to go to the airport, but through the circumstances of what's happened, he has to basically reschedule his flight. And he's like, he ends the call with his mother where she's disappointed. And the chapter ends with him getting a call from a UPS driver that found her body, that her head was crushed by a chandelier and she's fucking dead. So before we even leave the city, before Bo, Bo even leaves, he is conflicted. Like, is his mom dead or not? And we get like a very brief cameo of Bill Hader as the UPS driver, and it's just really funny. But that just like propels us into him having an emotional breakdown and getting hit by a car, which is like, it's just such a beautiful way to transition us into chapter two. Chapter two, like I said, is about Bo starting his new life. Basically, the people that hit him with his car have been taking care of him, and he's living with this Midwest religious family. They have a dead veteran son that they are kind of like replacing Bo with. The parallels between every family in this movie that is interesting introduced is disconnected, it's disjointed, but in just different ways. In this way, the parents that are taking care of Bo, and the two parents are Nathan Lane and Holly from The Office. I don't know the actress's name. She's awesome, but Holly, Michael Scott's whore. No! They are so funny, but they are also like so emotionally manipulative, and it seems like they are not processing the death of their child in an appropriate way at all. And it's this awkward thing where they are like immediately immediately making Bo this like replacement of their son. And it makes the chaotic energy of their daughter that much more insane. Nathan Lane is like this doctor and there's this great scene with the daughter where she's like, she just takes this whole thing of pills. You don't even know what it is. And he's like, don't be mixing those with the other pills you took. They're like, ah, she's gonna do what she wants because she is like this doped up kid that they just don't really care about because I think they're so blinded by the trauma of what happened with their son that they're just kind of like, ah, you know, she does, she has pills pills, whatever. Like, guilt is another huge part of this, of Bo feeling guilty for not being able to make it to his mom's house, and his mom's lawyer basically calls him, and they're like, Bo, you're fucking up. You're such a disappointment. You're not here. We've had to, we can't even bury the body. We can't have a service, so it's just this decaying corpse without a fucking head just sitting here because they're waiting for Bo to get there, and it's another underlying theme of guilt, of Bo feeling guilty that not only did he miss the flight, but now he's, like, stopping the funeral of his mom. But that guilt translates so well because I feel like the parents feel guilty over their son's death and they feel guilty for not being able to, I guess, protect him in a way because they're letting the sons, the dead sons, Buddy, who is a war vet, the shell-shocked veteran, live in the backyard in a trailer. And he's like emotionally totally unhinged and they have to like sedate him with syringes. It's fucking, it's like a twister. I was having a panic attack watching this guy. There's so many moments where the, this huge man is just like glaring at Bo through these like glass doors and Nathan Lane who's like the steals the show of this movie it's just like ah Bo don't worry about him ah he's a big teddy bear we just have he hasn't had his pills yet and it's uh there's so many great moments with Nathan Lane trying to be like a cool dad you know like I'm gonna catch you on the flip flop Bo and you're like it's just so out of place but I mean uh, chapter two is basically just a large character study of a family not processing emotions each individually such interesting characters Nathan Lane is like a hot shot surgeon who is taking care of Bo, but also he keeps like making up reasons why he can't take Bo to his mom's funeral. And it kind of seems like they're just trying to sedate him and like make him feel comfortable enough to where he'll forget about his old family and just indoc be indoctrined into this new family. The mom is just as crazy. There's this great moment in this dinner scene where they're like looking, they're all holding hands as if they're praying, but they're not saying anything. And they're just looking at this like picture of their dead son underneath their dead son's like painted portrait. It's like, it's not goodbye it's just like a temporary hello it's it's a really weird sign that's like you would find it at like in someone's bathroom I don't fucking know it's just such an inappropriate sign to have under like a dead child's photo I mean, I'm not saying dead child who's a man but still it's like their dead son so it's 
both thematically two themes of like not handling your emotions properly and just like guilt. Guilt is such a huge theme in this movie. But as we transcend out of chapter two, this is where the movie gets completely surrealist. The first two chapters are very funny and it's like very easy to understand what's happening. It kind of feels like the roller coaster is starting to dip and it's going into an insane surrealist nightmare, which feels intentional. It feels like the farther we go, the more intense this like illusion or this nightmare becomes for Bo, almost as if you're watching his own descent into madness. It's like almost like you're trying to crawl into the deepest parts of your mind to find an answer for something that's probably just not even there, which chapter three, Bo stumbles across a traveling theater group, but essentially they sit down to watch the play and it's verbatim what's happened so far in the story of Bo's life, except at a certain point in the story, Bo freeing himself of the guilt he feels for his mother, which I'm pretty sure she's embodied as an angel. And it's about him going off and not seeking this significant apology or answer for the traumatic things his mother has done. It's about him serving himself and finding a new family, putting his love into a wife and putting his time into a craft, which gets him money. He finds value in that. He has children. And it's this transcending, beautifully shot voyage of animation, set pieces, Joaquin living an entire life in this theatrical experience until there's heartbreak and there's a great storm divides him and his family and the rest of his adult years are spent looking for this family that he lost long ago until he is reunited with them once again. And by the time we get to this part, it looks like he's in his 90s or something. He's like 90 year old Joaquin Phoenix and he stumbles across the exact play that he's in and the people up on the stage are his sons and they come in and they're talking to him and they're just like, it's 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 held for such a long time. He's like crying and he's happy and it's this like embrace, but it lingers like a little too long and he keeps like kind of grabbing them and bringing them back in to the point where you're like, this doesn't feel right. Like this feels unnatural. And essentially the kids are asking for if there's any other family that they have, you know, and Joaquin, 90 years old, says their grandpa and their grandma, but their grandpa died long ago because he had sex with his mom. And that's why he's never had sex because it's a hereditary disease that, they, that he has passed down to them. And the kids are confused because they're like, well, dad, how did you have us if you've never had sex? And it's like this really funny beat of Joaquin being like, <laughs> like, I'd be like, uh, I don't know. And we snap back to this reality of Bo sitting and looking at the play. Like, he has lived this entire exaggerated dream in his head, only to be cut short by the realization, like, oh, yeah, that would never happen because I'm too afraid to have sex with a woman. <laughs> it's a very interesting way of, like, kind of the dream he would have if he wouldn't, if he would just stop worrying about the approval of his mother. It's a very fun way to show that. And such, I mean, it's such a dream drawn out thing. It's so dry and so slow that you could just see people kind of like but because it feels so long, it does feel like this like extended life. Like you feel like you've like lived this life with him. That's how long it feels like we've been in here until it's cut short by him realizing that he hasn't had sex and that that wouldn't make any sense. And that's where we end chapter three. We enter chapter four, which is the the last final layer of the surrealist nightmare hell, which is Bo making it to his mom's house. And as Bo reaches his mom's house, it is a sense of clarity because he sees her dead body. It's just a body in a coffin without a head. It's very funny. It kind of reads a lot like a hereditary thing, like even the clothes and stuff. It made me think of the old woman's coffin in the hereditary scene. I don't know why, just stylistically, I was like, oh, it looks a lot the same. Chapter four is all about kind of like the accumulation of all the things that he wanted are being presented to him. Like a girl that he used to fantasize about, they met on like a cruise ship. She gave him a, a picture of herself and said, wait for me. They knew each other for like two days. It's pretty funny, but she's there and she takes Bo's virginity, but Bo doesn't die. He thinks he's going to die because he's getting ready to, you know, finish. I'm about to come. And he doesn't and he's so relieved. And it's kind of like, it feels like the movie hits this pinnacle of like his hypochondria is kind of melted away with this realization that he's been living in fear. But as he looks up, the woman has died from the sex. And you find out that the mom faked her own death and that these like series of events that have been happening in the film have been under her eye and under her supervision 
situation and the only way that she could have gotten Bo to come to her house is to fake her own death and like have this huge orchestrated plan and it feels like this giant fuck you from the mom kind of thing. Basically the movie ends on Bo being judged. He like his mom collapses and dies under the realization that Bo wants to kill her. He like grabs her and strangles her but then he stops he's like I'm sorry mommy and the shock of that kills her. He gets in a boat goes onto a lake and basically goes into this like fucking cave. I hope you're keeping along with me. He's in this cave and it's like this giant aquarium. It looks like a like a Shamu show tank area. The mom is there. She's not dead. And there's like a guy who is saying all of the horrible things that Bo has done to his mother. And he's like presenting it to this court. And the movie kind of just ends with him being found guilty and he capsizes and he kind of dies. He drowns in his own guilt. The boat kind of goes and you hear him drowning. He wasn't able to process the emotions that he had and he was totally consumed by it and you are kind of led to believe in my opinion that Bo maybe went insane or he lived his life completely in the shrouds of this like turmoil of a relationship and that's the end of the movie and when I say that I've been in a lot of disappointed movie theaters this is one of the top ones I mean people the guy next to us is just like Jesus fucking Christ that was terrible this is a career you know, my final thoughts are, you know, this movie is experimental. It's all over the place. I mean, this movie is, it's fucking insane. And when I mean insane, it's not like jackass where it's like guys tearing off their testicle hair and you're like, I can't believe they did that. This movie challenges its viewer with trying to process what's happening in front of them. And I think a lot of people will find that to be negative and they'll find that to be bad filmmaking, but it feels like such a translucent approach of a director wanting to like get something off of his chest except he has 30 million dollars to work with and that to me is just fucking awesome visually the movie is amazing the cinematography is beautiful like the weird practical effects in certain scenes the way that like we introduce flashback sequences and dreamlike sequences and how they weave together into like this beautiful quilt it's like a beautiful tapestry that's what this movie feels like interwoven stories that are collectively and beautiful beautifully put together that it's just like, it's just, Wow, oh, it just feels great. If you go into this movie and you're completely absent with the idea of wanting to look into a deeper part of yourself, then I could see you being blind to this. But I think watching this film and if you have any instances of being depressed, having anxiety, rough relationships with your family, having any kind of guilt over decisions you've made, it's very easy to associate a lot of this iconography and the storytelling with yourself. I know that there's a lot of parts in the film where I was like, holy fuck, that's just, that's talking directly to me and this decision I've made or problems I have with my own self that I'm not gonna get into here. It's been a long time since I've been so viscerally I don't know, touched by a movie in a long time. Yes, I'm a fan of the director. I think I might be biased in that way. All in all, a nine and a two. I don't know what to tell you. You know, it seems like a wish-washy answer. On some days, I think I'd be like, fuck that movie. And other days, I think I would just be like, oh God, that just hit the spot. It's like a good back itch, that's what I would say. So if you don't have to itch your back, you just, you don't need to itch it. But if some few times you gotta itch that back, Get your hand back there and go to town. Check out this movie, Bo is Afraid. Also, uh, Strange Things About the Johnsons. Maybe do a double feature. Maybe start off with the strange thing about the Johnsons and then see how that translates into Bo is Afraid because I feel like Ari Aster's got a little bit of problem. I think he's got something, uh, some kind of family issue that we're not aware of yet and maybe in the future he'll make another fucking disturbing family piece. Because essentially that's been every single one of his movies are a nightmare family scenario. Did you catch that? Strange thing about the Johnsons, hereditary, fucking midsummer, and now Bo is afraid. My God, man. Call your mom. <laughs> Call your mom. <laughs> Call your mom or fucking find her and beat the shit out of her. I don't know what you have to do, but do it. I should probably put at the end of the video that the strange thing about the Johnsons is all about family rape, about the, uh, the son raping the dad the whole time. That's the big twist. <laughs> It's a short film. I'm going to be real. I bet there's going to be a lot of people pissed off. Is it like Hereditary? Mm, not really. <laughs>